Ladies and gentlemen, I understand that we have almost 70 registered tonight for our webinar, which we've entitled Stepping into Science. And I'm looking at the screen at present and I can see Willow, Harry and Kiara. So we're all here and I hope all of you are out there. By way of introduction, I'd just like to share my screen for a little while and to talk a little bit about why we're doing this. We're doing this because, uh, uh, can you believe that? We're doing this because a whole lot of us believe that science, technology, engineering, and maths are very important for the future. And we are trying to attract as many people into uh, STEM areas of, uh, of working, of research, of study. So I put together a grant application to the federal government through Inspiring Australia and our Hunter Innovation and Science Hub, we were successful in getting funding to put on five seminars, five groups of scientists to talk about their personal odysseys to a life of science. So what's an odyssey? Odyssey comes from the uh, early Greek uh, uh, writings where the god Odysseus was on a 10 year journey wandering around the, the universe and he needed somebody to look after his son Telemachus. So he invited his friend Mentor to look after Telemachus while he went on an odyssey. And our theme tonight is, what is your odyssey? Who are your mentors? Because if you have mentors, then you can go through life a little easier. What is a mentor? A mentor is somebody you look up to, somebody who is in a job that you think you would like to have. You go and ask them and say, how did you get there? And you'll find nine, 99 times out of 100, they will assist you. You ask them a second time, a third time, then you have a mentor, somebody to look after you as you go through your uh, steps of life. So remember that as we are following through these seminars tonight. So what is uh, my, my journey? Well, I can tell you, we grew up uh, very, very poor on farms. And it was mum who always said to my brother and I, education is what you need. You must go to university. She'd never been to university. Nobody in our family had been to university except my brother and me. We were the first generation. Currently, I'm still at university. I'm an emeritus professor at the University of Newcastle, and I'm very happy. So I did a science honours degree at the University of Adelaide starting in 63, then a PhD at Flinders, then a couple of years at a university in Belgium uh, where I had to learn to speak French, otherwise we couldn't buy any food uh, at the supermarket. Then a year in Cambridge and I came to Newcastle in 1974 and I've been here ever, ever since. As I said, uh, I'm, I'm an emeritus professor, but I'm also director and founder of a biotechnology company that we set up in 2018. On the way through, I established the second hands-on science center in Australia that became that was called Supernova. That became the Newcastle Museum and is still running some 35, 40 years after that. I had three wonderful years setting up the University of Newcastle's campus in Singapore. And then uh, coming back from Singapore, I had eight years as director 
of an Institute for the Environment. As well, I set up the Hunter, I, I run the Hunter Innovation and Science Hub, I run the Hunter Valley Electric Vehicle Festival. And one of the joys of my life, and I hope when the borders open again, I'll be able to do it again, is to take undergraduate students to Indonesian Borneo, where of course, we see the proboscis monkey and the orangutan. So tonight, we've got three wonderful panelists speaking. Kiara Harrison is starting her journey into research with her honours year after having done her undergraduate bachelor degree. Harry has uh, finished his engineering degree and is now out in the workforce. And Willow has come back from the workforce and she is starting a PhD uh, a little bit later in life. So we'll have those panelists speak, then we'll have question and answers. And of course, you have to put in your questions. How do you do that? Well, there's a little tab either on the bottom of your screen, except mine suddenly gone to the top of my screen, and you can put in a chat. I see there are eight in the chat, but we don't want to, we want the questions in the q and I'm sorry. I'll have to look at that chat in a minute because I'll be able to do so because I'm going to ask uh, Kiara to start her presentation. Over to Kiara. How did we go? Kiara, you are muted. Yeah, sorry, I'm just, I was, yes, evening everyone and welcome to my site Odyssey. I'm Kiara and as Tim said, I had a bit of a irregular journey into the world of reproductive science, um, beginning with working several different types of jobs when I was younger, from KFC to McDonald's to uh, accounts manager to retail to mechanic and so on. But... What I eventually did was decide around 22 years old that I wanted to pursue study. So ended up enrolling in the Open Foundation pathway to university. So Open Foundation is for people who, uh, if you finished year 12 and you received an ATAR, perhaps you haven't received a good enough ATAR as what you would need to enter your program. Perhaps like myself, I left high school in year 11, you didn't receive an ATAR at all. Um, or people who would just like to get study skills and uh have an entryway into university without becoming overwhelmed by undergraduate so during open foundation we take two classes i took science and maths once i finished this i didn't think i did that well but i did end up getting an offer to 2015 uh university study for this i chose to take a bachelor of science with a, a disaster management major it didn't really click for me that that first major, but eventually I just happened to take a biology course, pure happenstance, but I ended up loving it. So I switched my major to biology. It was in my second year of study. I saw this amazing, um, passionate dude talk about his field of research, Jeff Diolis. Um, and I, am, I remember sitting there thinking to myself, this guy really seems to love life and love what he does. I want to do that. And I have it in the back of my head for the rest of my undergraduate study. So for the rest of my undergraduate study, for me, it was really just trying to figure out what worked for me as a student. I figured out that I am terrible at studying at home. I get too distracted. So I started studying at the library and at coffee shops. Um, I figured out how to take notes, which is actually a skill. Um, and it's something that a lot of people take for granted. So... In this, I, I kept looking out for opportunities and making friends and making connections. And one of them is when I met Tim in 2018, I think it was, where he took me and 20 university students to New, uh, to Indonesia Borneo through the New Colombo Plan, which is a scholarship. It's about $2,000, if I remember correctly. And you spend two weeks in the Bornean jungle. And we looked at the proboscis monkey, like Tim said, at the top of your screen, you'll see a little female Bacanta monkey. 
Uh, so she has the little nose, but the males have this enormous, massive proboscis or nose that they use for reproductive purposes. Um, so down the bottom is a cohort of people that I went to Indonesia with. So we were on the first trip that Tim took to Indonesia, and I thought that was pretty cool. And I've just got some photos here to show what we sort of did because it was just this amazing trip. So we rebuilt uh, habitats for the proboscis monkeys. They live in mangroves. And they're one of the only species that can actually eat the mangrove leaves because the mangrove leaves have such high salt content that no other animal can regurgitate them or eat them uh, because otherwise they'll become dehydrated and die. It's just, you can't have that much salt. But proboscis monkeys, they primarily feed on these salt leaves and the loss of habitat from palm oil plantations and things like that led to uh, a company called Sahaba Bekantan Indonesia called Save Bekantan Indonesia or Save Proboscis Monkeys. Um, we went over there and we got down in the mud and we helped them rehabilitate some of the land. So other opportunities, uh, we went to this remote village in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And we're 20 university students from Newcastle. We are nobody. And we got an entire village shut down for the day and they welcomed us. And I'm talking about like government, government officials, the kids, everyone down in the bottom right hand corner. There's kids that dressed up in these beautiful silk blue outfits and lined the roads as we came in. Remember, we're, we're uni kids, like we, we, we are no one. But it was just this cool experience where they were so encouraged by Australian students coming all the way over to their country to say, hey, we love your environment. We love your wildlife. We want to help you protect it um, and encourage you to protect it. So down the bottom right is a shot from the uh, a boat that took us out to see some wild monkeys where part of the entire village, the rest of them were up above the boat on the other side. Where they shut it down just so that they could meet us and see us. And it was crazy. And then after that, we went and saw some wild orangutans, which was absolutely inc like incredible. Um, and then at the start of 2020, again with Tim, and I thank him for this endlessly, he actually took myself and nine other students to Kenyan Africa for two weeks as part of the Endeavour Scholarship. So we stayed with the Maasai tribes people, which are famous for their, um, they do a jumping tribal dance, which is very unique. Uh, they also have this dietary way of surviving long journeys where they migrate cattle, where they drink a mixture of the blood and the milk and that sustains them and they live off the land and all this wonderful thing. So we got to stay with them and do warrior training and go on safari and do these incredible things. So these are a couple of shots from our safari and going out and doing some bushwhacking. So down the bottom, you'll see this fruit that is hollow, but the Maasai warriors, when they're out and about, they'll actually eat this. Uh, no other animal seems to because it has that large spike that you see on the fruit, but the Maasai warriors love it. To me, it tastes terrible, but they love it. Um, and other things like we got to see cheetahs and lion families up close, and giraffes, elephants, all the rest of it, big five. Although we didn't get to see a rhinoceros, but they're very rare, so that's fine. So I got to undertake in that opportunity. But back to my uh, more science-based opportunities, revolving, uh, revolving around volunteering, and a lot of this has been to do with Tim. So I've helped him out with the Electric Vehicle Festival. That's me uh, waving the flag for the end of the race in 2019, I think, maybe 2018. I've also helped him out since with the Mini Electric Vehicle Festival, which is small solar car kits and teaching kids and families all about the importance of solar and how it's generated and the faults with solar as well as the positives. And I work at HISH with Tim, so it's the Hunter Innovation and Science Hub, just bringing things like National Science Week to the Hunter, as well as a lot of community programs. That's really cool. But you're here tonight to hear about my more, my sci odyssey into research, specifically male infertility. So at the end of my undergraduate degree in my last semester, I contacted that guy that I saw present, Jeff Diolis. Um, I sent him an email as part of an advanced research project that I wasn't really sure what I was going to do or what was going to happen, but I sent him an email saying, hey, is this something you'd be interested in supervising? 
just me, just a little project. What do you think? And he said, absolutely. Let's do it. Come in, have a meeting and we'll have a chat. So Jeff is foremost a researcher that works with the effect of mobile phones on male fertility. And one thing that's involved in that is this heat shock protein. And what this heat shock protein does is when a cell is under stress, what happens is proteins become unfolded. So basically it gets unglued and uh, needs to happen for it to be functional is it to glue back together. And heat shock proteins come back and they attach to these broken apart proteins and put them back together and make them functional. Or if they're too broken apart, they degrade them or mark them for degradation so that we can clear out all the bad stuff and keep the good stuff in. So with male fertility, these heat shock proteins have another critical role in fertility. And that's that they are positioned in the very tip of the sperm. And there's a little switch that when it's off, the sperm, the egg can't interact. But when it's switched on through, you know, interactions with the female reproductive tract, when it's switched on, it can actually interact with the female's egg. So it's very important because if you can't talk to it, you can't have fertilization, you won't get pregnancy um, and kids and all the rest of it. It's very downstream consequence situation. So my project was looking at... Uh, specific key species that we use in research and how identical is the specific heat shock protein that is involved in this fertilization switch how identical is it between species because if it's the same between species then we can easily target it whereas if it's very different from human to say mice which are a common model in research then we can't really research it the way that we normally would we'd have to go about it different ways so we did this project on heat shock proteins and at the end of it jeff and i had built this report and he and i discussed me going on to an honors program so an honors program is after your undergraduate study you do a year of specific research on a specific topic culminating in a thesis and a thesis is essentially a write-up of your entire honors journey um, across that 12 months so what we decided on was I would join his research in looking at the reaction of sperm to wireless communication technology. So that's not only mobile phones, that's Bluetooth, that's your smartwatch, that's your modem, your radio, wireless headphones, anything that wirelessly communicates with one object to another uses an energy wave in order to talk. And that has the capacity to penetrate the skin depending on the type of energy. So we wanted to look at how does that type of energy affect male fertility. So what we found is that you might assume that when you apply energy to biological tissue, you see an increase in temperature, but that wasn't the case because you're not holding a device directly on your skin, you're holding it away and your energy in that way can be transferred, but you do get these wireless signal waves and they're called RF or radio frequency electromagnetic energy. So through research, uh, one of Jeff's previous PhD students, Brendan Houston, found that it does interact and it can impact male fertility, but it's not through temperature, it's through an oxidative stress mechanism. So what that means is that a normal consequence of biological function is the production of reactive oxygen species. And they are essentially, um, when something happens, you have a byproduct, which is an oxygen molecule, that is quite angry. And what it does is try to, well, it, it, first of all, it's unsatisfied. So it's missing a key part of its outer valence shell, meaning that it just needs to go steal something, from, uh, steal that outer component from another biological molecule, whether that be DNA, proteins, fats, whatever it might be. But once it steals that component from another biological molecule, it damages that molecule because now that molecule has something missing so it's this oxidative stress cascade that we see because you're seeing an uh, increase in that mitochondrial ROS because it this oxidative stress we've seen or predicted that it starts in the mitochondria because that's the source of your energy mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell 
So from this, we've realized that we need updated public health guidelines because the most updated public that we have is from 1998. And that's before things like, you know, iPhones and wireless routers in every home and smartwatches and all these other technologies that co-expose us, uh, females, males, kids, everyone. And we need to accurately reflect what the scientific community is saying is happening, such as when mobile phones are in the pockets of guys down near their bits and that causes increased exposure. And we do this for extended amounts of time and potentially with multiple devices. So there is an impact. It won't necessarily knock out your fertility completely. It'll just reduce it. So no need to stress too much. We're on it. Um, so I just want to finish tonight with saying a couple of lessons that I've learnt throughout my journey so far, and that is to say yes to opportunity. Through this, I was able to go to Indonesian Borneo and Kenya, and even afterwards, I was able to go to Egypt. Uh, ask the question, without asking Jeff if I could do an honours project with him or an advanced research project with him, I wouldn't be where I am. Never stop. This is key. It doesn't matter if you're in science or a different field. It is so important and to acknowledge your victories because even the little things that feel so small can be that stepping stone that bring you to that larger, uh, important role. So thank you for listening to that. That's all I've got to say. Wonderful, Kiara. Well done. Well done. And I love the angry oxygen. Wow. Angry oxygen. Just, uh, you could almost make a song uh, of that. I was delighted by your odyssey and uh, I look forward, I'm sure, as you do, to a wonderful future that you will have in science. So, our second speaker today is Harry Callan. And, and Harry, um, I'm, I'm in trouble on my slide there, Harry, might be better. I've absolutely lost myself. And when I can't see myself, I get very upset, but now I've found myself again. So our second speaker tonight is the handsome fellow in the bottom left-hand corner of my screen, and that is Harrison Callan. Harrison Callan is able to tell you anything about his life right now because he's going to share his screen. Over to Harry. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. And thanks, Kiara, for sharing your story. Um, I'm thinking that you can see my screen now. Awesome. So as Tim says, my name's Harrison Callan, but um, my go-to line is that I only get Harrison when I'm in trouble with mum. So I'm not going to be in trouble with Tim anymore. And uh, feel free to message me, Harry, in the chat if you have any questions. But my Sci Odyssey is about being a water... Well, journey towards being a water resources engineer. And that's just a title. I don't really know what it means, but I'll get underway if I can find my arrows. I'd just like to start by um, acknowledging the Awabakal people, the traditional custodians on the land on which I work, live and play. I'd also like to acknowledge traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, water and community. I pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I think it's a, it's a good note because there has been um, First Nations scientists here for thousands of years before I walked this path. So my take on science, um, I used to, um, for about a year or so, I volunteered selling raffle tickets for my local club and I'd spent about you know three and a half years at uni studying the flow of water um, and before that, doing, you know, science at school, I thought I knew everything, but um, it turned out one day someone told me, you know, what are you doing wasting your time studying all this physics when I could tell you that water flows downhill and I'll have $10 worth of tickets, thanks. Um, and I was a budding scientist. I was just in awe of everything going on in the world. I went to one of those, um, you know, new concept uh, sort of uh, preschools where they teach you to love learning rather than this is how you spell your name. So heading into 
kindergarten, I had no idea how to spell my name. And by the end of it, I think I'd overtaken just because of that love of playing in the sandpit and colouring in turned to, oh, this stuff with letters is pretty cool. And uh, on the lines of budding scientists, I uh, vividly remember every Christmas I'd set up an experiment. I'd put carrots in a bowl of water, lots of water there um, on the front balcony. And then when I'd come back in the morning, it would all be gone. Nothing but the stubs of the carrots left. And I couldn't, like, I couldn't explain how it happened because I'd never saw the reindeers. And it was this first experiment that I was just, every year I'd have a go. And uh, obviously I, I stopped doing the experiment around 13 or 14, but until then I got a good data set to say that they were very thirsty after their big journey. So, so I'll talk about Catalyst because it's about my journey. Um, so once I stopped watching Play School and I started getting this grasp that the world that I was living in has a lot of rules uh, and those rules can be beautiful or they can be quite simple and they can be explained on TV at about Thursday night, 7 p.m. Um, in chemistry, of course, we, we talk about the, um, something that starts a reaction and it's not changed itself in that reaction. It might you know, speed it up as well. That's what a, a catalyst is. But more generally, we talk about life-changing moments or something that sparks something. So my spark was just this David Attenborough style. Show me pictures of galaxies and tell me that you know, stars are a million degrees hot. And that's really you know, started my spark. Heading into high school, I became one of those people that really liked high school. I was one of those weird guys over on the right there. Any chance to give a, a happy photo and put my hand up in class to be the class clown, uh, I took it. And then it got obviously to the nitty gritty end of school. Harry, you need to pick, you know, 10 units to get, you know, your final ATAR. And I thought, stuff it, I'll do 13. Um, physics, chemistry, biology, I had to have all three. Could have done earth sciences but they limit you to three so that wasn't going to be a reality i did extension one maths which is a, a bit of a funny story i just i think i backed myself um thinking that i was good at stem yeah i'll do extension maths why not which later turned out to be a bit of a um a crucial part of my life and uh i know tim likes to mention that i love music because i do and that's something that brings us all together scientists non-scientists uh, art is something i really value and I did advance, I did English because I had to, because I'm not, not much of a wordsmith when, I, when it comes to putting pen to paper. So I'm Telly Mackis and I had a few mentors. Um, there was a, a critical maths teacher that I had, as I was saying, I backed myself with the extension maths and I failed my first exam quite miserably, 16 out of 90. Why they set a maths test out of 90, I don't know, but they're showing off there with their percentage calculations. Anyway, uh, I think we've had some discussions, robust discussions about how my maths teacher didn't like how much I was talking. Uh, we didn't really have a similar sort of personality, but he said, you do physics, you do chemistry, you do biology, and you know maths is you know, the vector through which you can apply all of this knowledge to the real world. And I just thought, well, if he says that, he seems pretty smart. I, I may as well ride this. And, uh, and I continued to grow and grow into each assessment. And I'm, uh, really loving maths and it was it was my strongest subject outside of music and then the photo on the right here is um the little old ladies up at the plot i call it it's a march street community gardens and i volunteered there for my um duke of edinburgh award uh and the there was phd knowledge here so whilst um you know some people might go through the formal ways of learning through university tertiary education certainly these women had science knowledge you know coming out out of there is that just like books for so I could really only grow uh, cucumbers whichever I can grow but they could grow whatever they wanted and so that was something I really looked up to moving into university knowing that I love plants uh, and that I like science I was going to go to UNSW and do advanced science become a plant geneticist I was going to make high protein rice and save the world with super crops and I liked all those proteins that you know cut into DNA and put certain genes there I didn't do that at all I um I signed up for the email uh, I was in the system uh, for UNSW and mum said another mentor to um to me big one um, practical mentor harry you're very lazy um you know you might have to live with nan or your auntie if you can't pay for your own accommodation work four or five jobs during you know whilst doing full-time study so what did i do the neighbor talked to the neighbor about it he offered me a job as a soil tester 
And uh, I thought, I'll do civil environment because that links to, you know, big infrastructure and building roads. So let's do this. And like Tiara says, just kind of embrace um, the path. Um, turns out I didn't really want to do the roads and the steel beams and the concrete slabs. Uh, and I really like the environmental side as I do have that background in being a bit of a, a hippie, uh, greenie. Um, and so I thought, what could I do? I'll just drop the civil and I'll pick the environmental up because I still got lots of that science core in environmental engineering, um, particularly chemistry and stuff like that. Um, physics is necessary for all engineering. And if we look to the photo on the right, that's me doing chemistry with a smile on my face, but that's a titration and I'm colorblind. And anyone who knows anything about titrations knows that there's a, you know, a point of inflection where the liquid changes color and that's where everyone can figure out, oh, I've got the right concentration. For me, I went a couple of moles past uh, the mark. And it's a joke that I have with my friends. Most people who aren't at chemistry back might not know what a mole past the mark means. But I had a dilemma about oh, fundamentals year was over, maths, science, you know, where was the people at interaction in engineering? You know, what are these people doing sitting in offices playing with Excel? Um, should I change the engineering to perhaps the most people-related profession in the world, midwifery, delivering people for people with people? Um, Mum brought me home a few books in the library, The Wondrous Birth um, and whatnot. And uh, it turns out I, she figured out I hadn't even held a baby. So we decided together with you know my mentor, probably engineering was a good fit for me. Um, now I liked it enough and it got better years three, two, three, and four. And of course, university life was a bit bigger than just having a dilemma over too much maths. So I was playing sport and playing music. On the left, we won a grand final, total underdogs. And it was a, it was a, that, was a that was a good feeling. Um, and they, you know, you can't just be all science. Um, well, I guess you can, but it's good to have balance. And I find that I keep my music up as well whilst I do my science on the right there. Playing a gig in Sydney, that was a lot of fun. Um, and I've been in a bunch of unsuccessful bands. So that helps with learning how to fail, uh, which you undoubtedly do. And like Kiara, I was lucky enough to travel with Tim, who's been a mentor since the 2019. I've got the 2018 date there because I couldn't Photoshop 2019 on nicely. But uh, you can see us down here, Camp Leakey. It's a beautiful spot there. And if you haven't heard of the, you know, the, the, the three women uh, under Leakey who um, have gone and done research in primates, you've got to, you've got to look at that. Um, and I got a nice photo on the left there because I like nice photos of me. But this was a groundbreaking trip, right? Two weeks of cultural immersion. And personally, after that, I went for two weeks um, of a placement at a large mining company in Indonesia. So I got to see science, not just the culture, um, science from an Indonesian perspective. I was lucky enough to meet Benson. Uh, Benson, as uh, Kiara talked about, is a Bekantan. Uh, endangered species. He might have a massive nose, but he has an even bigger heart. And he's remained a friend of mine even after the trip. And uh, so he, he was with me for the two week placement at Adaro. What that's meant, uh, oh, and before I get there, what happens is water flowing downhill, right? We can summarize, grossly oversimplify that. We'd spent three days, you know, going up the tributary trees upstream on a boat powered. Um, and on the last night, Benson fell overboard. We lost him. It was terrible. There's crocodiles. There's all sorts of you know predators. And then on the way back, because we understood physics and this is the beauty of science, we're heading back downstream. So we know well, he'll be floating downstream. And sure enough, we found him and uh, we got him off the shores of the terrible um, you know uh, predator-ridden uh, tributaries. And I got him back to bed and uh, rested up after a night in the cold. And then you know, bringing not only your friends home, but your scientific experiences, your, your, your cultural experiences, it has been a good thing. And keeping the relationship with Tim and the people I went with post uh, the trip has been a massive, um, you know, fire in the belly. Uh, so that this placement that I talk about, I've told you about the crazy midwifery, um, can't really explain how I came to that conclusion, can't explain how the reindeers ate the carrots every, um, every Christmas. And this is me at my placement. They've, there's a couple of dams that they've put in rehabilitated um, landforms. At the top of these things, they're at the top of the catchment. We hear about salmon swimming upstream, but 
in these locations, the, the rainfall would fill the dam up. Um, it would all flow downhill. There's no upstream and suddenly there'd be fish in the dams. None of the workers, they interviewed everyone. None of the workers could explain how they got there. They didn't put them there. Um, and it's just one of those things that they kind of tasked me with a, just try and think of a few things, how, how the fish might've got there. They were thinking of bird droppings, um, you know, people breaking into the land, putting fish in there so that they could fish later. And uh, it never really got solved. So I think that's the beauty of science. There's a couple of things, big questions hanging over your life where you never really get to the bottom of it. And that's just science. And it's something that I've had to deal with. Sometimes we just don't know the answer. And on the right there, me hugging a tree, this is a rehabilitated forest and it's a crucial moment for myself. I'd volunteered at, at Tim's um, mine rehab conference. And to see mammals like the, the proboscis monkey had come back into these habitats. There was uh, signs of uh, mammals through um, mosquitoes and the birds were singing. And you just think this is a landform that we built um, and to see some rehab rehabilitation on a scale like that was really important to go, wow, environmental engineering, maybe I can make a difference. So taking that sort of that learning into my final honest year, a um, lot of project work and a bit of a uh, research. So this research was mapping mangroves in American Samoa using um, data, spatial data and um, remotely sensed data. Um, in this particular location, they're experiencing higher than average, um, higher than the global average sea level rise. And they've also had some uh, impacts from uh, tectonic plates slipping under each other. So there's not only the continents moving, their land mass is moving further down um, relative to the sea level, but what they're seeing the um, rise in sea level, you know, three mils per year, like everyone else. And I was trying to look and see whether my methods using open source data and free software uh, could pick up that acceleration once the landmass started going down at a faster rate, could it pick up that the mangroves were migrating, you know, for, uh, faster land as a result of that? And I got some interesting results. First of which is probably, you know, this is a humanitarian background at the end of the day. There's um, a good data set here because of USGS presence and the North American Oceanic uh, Association. So it's a good standard to set and then we maybe apply regional methods, but really, um, just trying to look and see, can we do it with cheap, freely available um, stuff so that we could apply this regionally and get an outcome for a really vulnerable um, wetland ecosystem. So the results go that you needed commercial software, which was probably what I could have said to you at the start. The small wetlands are, you know, I needed the two meter by two meter pixel resolution to be able to make a high enough resolution delineation of the mangrove margin to show that creep landward. But then over in, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but in the middle of the image, we can see that the 2020 in the dark blue is actually further seaward than the yellow and the white, which are earlier years. So there's this sort of idea that mangroves are resistant. Um, you can see higher acceleration in sea level rise and you would expect mangroves to follow based on their preferred inundation extent. Certainly over on the left, we can see this tributary uh, has moved uh, further landward based on probably sea level rise. And it seems to be, I'm careful about using statistics terms like correlated, but it looks like the, a bit of the cause there in the tributary has been from further inundation means mangroves go landward. But um, the variety of results was certainly meant that my discussion for my honours was like going here and there and saying, well, I might've had an inaccurate method. So I double check my method do everything and that's science. Maybe you've double checked your method, you've checked your assumptions, you've got better data and all of a sudden it's almost proving the opposite of what you're trying to prove. And that's not a bad thing. So that was a really important lesson before I head into industry, especially because I think you guys are picturing me as this global humanitarian map, mangrove mapper warrior. But really what I was doing was I was taking uh, the zero interaction approach with people. And I was plugging data from NASA and writing code in Java, which I had to teach myself to try and delineate where these mangroves were. And wouldn't it be nice if I got a field trip one day? So uh, moving into industry, um, field work is a lot different. I know Tim has been a good mentor and he, he's noted at the start uh, from the field, from the lectures of environmental engineering to the field work, instead of looking at the physics of why water flows downhill and how obvious that should be based on equations, 
I look at where is downhill and whether we should be worried about how much water is about to go there. Uh, so it's a critical difference. Uh, and often I get photographs of like album cover looking photos of my colleagues. Uh, and they're also selfies of myself. Um, I wish I could take, it's probably against some sort of rule if I show too many project photos, but obviously me with trees is something I like and an apple tree over on the right. And in terms of contaminated land um, evaluation, I would never eat these apples. So it's just for show. It's just to say, hey, mum, look at me. So conscious of time, um, I've just had this sense of awe, I guess, throughout my life. Um, I've worked with some amazing scientists um, and engineers, my supervisor, uh, Tim, all of my colleagues uh, at university and work. I've seen some incredible things in my short career, namely a massive pumpkin at the Lithgow show whilst I was on a field trip um, for some catchment uh, delineation analysis. Um, and like I said, with my weaving in the motif of having absolutely no idea how I got to certain decisions or why certain things are happening in, in, in the world, that's the beauty of science, um, to try and search for something uh, and prove something is a quest that all scientists love. But, you know, often we don't get there. And if we can explain why our method didn't work, then that's just as good for the people that come after us. Newton famously said, if I see this far, it's only because I stand on the shoulder of giants. And that's a, it's very modest coming from someone who made calculus in an afternoon, but uh, never stop learning. And I think that's something Kiara and I picked up from Tim. And finally, science is nothing without the scientists. And so the friends you make along the way, this is just a placeholder figure because I've got Tim, my supervisor, Inya, and a bunch of friends I've made along the way. It's, it's, that's what makes it for me. And I, I had a dilemma. Not enough people in engineering. Well, you find the people and you're collaborating with lovely people, or, you know, if, if you're proactive about it. And so that's what's made science science for me is the people. Well, there goes Harry. Thank you very much, Harry. And uh, it was fascinating to learn all sorts of things, but particularly about the community garden. That community garden clearly left you with a love of big pumpkins. And at the end, we saw the pumpkin. But uh, what I hope, uh, Harry, that your journey will also take you to doing something about climate change because we're going to run out of water. And our water is running the wrong way at present. And so we need, we really need to have people like you and Kiara and Willow all doing something about how the world's going to change. And with that, uh, I'd like to invite Willow to talk because Willow is starting her research again after many years in another place. Over to Willow. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully that comes up shortly. OK, yes, I think we're there. So good evening, everyone. And um, thanks for joining our storytelling um, webinar tonight. As um, Tim has alluded to, my journey has been a bit longer than um, Kiara and Harry's. In fact, mine's been three decades. But I promise not to take three times as long. Instead, I'm going to try and shove three times as much <laughs> into a short a period of time. So my science journey, which is currently I'm halfway through a PhD into flood preparedness research, it's taken a bunch of twists and turns. And it might seem that some of them are major non-science deviations. But thinking about it all, when I look back, actually science, and particularly my focus, which is social science, has been the backbone of my personal and my professional life. So to set the scene for you, the place I want to start actually is my last year of high school. Just gonna change slides, yay. I managed to get my slides working, good. All right, so um, high school. I Look, I grew up in Sydney and I was really lucky that the school I went to had a great, great view. So when lessons got really boring, you could look out across Sydney Harbour towards um, Sydney's North and Middle Head. I have to admit, I did that more than occasionally. My daughter tells me that actually I'm so old, there were dinosaurs around when I was in year 12. And at that time, the headmistress at my school was this remarkable woman called Miss Violet Medway. And she decided 
actually ahead of her time, she decided we needed to de-stress the HSC pressure. And she introduced special relaxing sports just for the year 12 students. And so it was why in year 12, I learnt um, to windsurf each week during school hours. There was no competition, there was no pass and fail. It was just the fun of learning a new skill. And she thought it would help de-stress us and make us better students. My daughter's actually sitting the HSC um, this year in the full shadow of COVID-19. And to anybody else doing that and to their parents, my heart is with you. Um, I wish actually that the government's entire HSC apparatus could learn from Ms Medway's teachings because it seems to me what Ms Medway taught was that there's struggles on everyone's life odyssey to achieve whatever starry moments you're lucky enough to experience in life. But right now for year 12 students, I think that competition among them doesn't actually help as much as if only we could set them a personal challenge just like our, my windsurfing one that's just for their mental health. I think we'd have some better outcomes. I think Miss Medway's strategy must have helped me because much to my surprise, I did really well on this thing called um, what back in the day was called four unit science. And with no other idea what to do at all, I followed that pathway to university. So my university life, um, I got a place doing a Bachelor of Science at Sydney Uni. And it sound, just because it sounded easy, I added geology to my first year, to first year subjects. It turned out that I loved it. It also turned out that it just wasn't quite that easy, um, but it was worth the effort. And because my note taking, Kiara, you mentioned this earlier, my note taking actually was um, fast and legible. Um, my lecture notes were highly sought after. And I think that was the way I first made friends. Certainly Dave, hello Dave, was one of the recipients of my uh, lecture notes. So to move away slightly away from humour, two really important lessons occurred during my first um, exp excursion into university life. Firstly, my supervisor of my honours year, Professor David Brannigan, who's actually a renowned Australian geologist and academic, and it's a shout out to him because he's just such an amazing mentor. He taught me a love of exploring what the, un the exploring the unknown beneath our very feet. And it takes detailed observation of what you see on the surface, but all the while, really importantly, understanding you can't be fixed and certain about what's going on below this ground, unless you can afford to run expensive drilling or geotechnical surveys, which we can't always afford to do. So you have to stay open to new theories, new methods of joining the dots where you can't see what's happening new evidence and being prepared to widen your perspective. And one of the biggest, what I learned was that certainty can be the biggest hindrance to scientific research. And the second thing I learned on that point was really more personal than technical. And that is when your ego comes to depend on being right, you're actually sunk as a researcher. Um, and you probably tend to show up as a judgmental rather than a compassionate person. And it's been a life lesson that I've tried to keep with me ever since then. So what ne happened next on my science odyssey? Well, that was university number one. So let's go and have a look at career number one. All right, so again, back in the days of the dinosaurs, the opportunities for women to work in the field as a geologist were pretty limited. And I didn't wanna be an academic, sorry, Tim. Um, so my path needed to take another term. And I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but my then boyfriend's father worked for an American investment bank. And he suggested maybe I could get a job in the finance industry. So I did. Um, at that time, banks had started lending money to mining projects based on the value of the future cash flow from what was the proven deposit under the ground, rather than being on the balance sheet of whichever company happened to own it, normally because it was owned by a small company that really didn't have a strong balance sheet. This, this financing mechanism was called project financing and it helped the Australian mining industry grow to be a global supplier. And it's, it's grown it into a sector that these days underpins significantly our economy. It probably seems to many people that, that banks, particularly given movies and the Royal Commission are overrun with um, people that are a Gordon Gecko stereotype. But that actually wasn't my experience at all. You know, the people that I met when I, when I became a graduate trainee at Westpac were, they were often third generation bankers. Their dad had been a banker, their grandfather had been a banker. And they had, um, they had this feeling of being guardians of sound lending practice. And Bruce Orty was one such, one such person. He, was a, he, he reflected that. And he was, I was lucky to get him as a boss and he's become a long-term mentor and a friend. And the ethos I learned from 
people like Bruce was that a bank's role is to allocate risk to different parts of our economy and to different parts of our society. And what they taught me was that we need to protect the health of the whole system and not do a risk transfer from a strong part of the economy to a weaker part of the economy or a risk transfer to the future by selling junk risk to superannuation funds because that builds up systemic risk for everyone. I may not be explaining this very well, but, but I guess my point is there's always a bigger picture. And wherever you see it today in a corporate or in a government or in academia or in a not-for-profit organization, it's everyone's job to understand and protect the system that surrounds and protects us, whether it's economic, social, environmental or physical. Don't dump toxic waste on others. Don't take from the future by overusing or polluting. And don't build shoddy apartment blocks, you know. It's not right. It never was. And frankly, guys, it never will be. So that was career. That was my first career. Once I got hooked on this idea of needing to know, I needed to know more about the bigger picture. And so for me, understanding the bigger picture meant I wanted to understand the bigger picture of business and how it worked. So uni beckoned again. And this time someone had told me about a place in Switzerland called IMD with a one year full-time MBA program. And that sounded a lot better to me than a two year full-time MBA program or a four year part-time one. So I applied to MBA, to, for an MBA at IMD and much to my surprise, I got a place. So I packed up my stuff and went off to Switzerland for a year. Long story short, I learned the theory and the research evidence behind how business works. I understand where the research evidence stops and the marketing flair takes over. However, there is actually something more important that I think I learned from my year at studying at IMD. In our six days a week of classes, which is why they can do it in one year, I didn't read the fine print, um, we worked in teams. You couldn't get through the workload if you didn't work as a team. There were 63 people in our year and they represented 35 nationalities. We were a mini world version of diversity. We had to navigate the cultural differences and we had to learn to collaborate. And basically we had to be better people if we wanted to succeed. Look, it's a personal view, but that lesson that I learned, it's a lesson I wish every day our political leaders took more to heart, particularly now with what's going on globally. The other thing I also learned while I was over there was this thing about strategic consulting. And I decided that, that oh, that's an interesting career. Maybe that would be a great way to help change corporations and help build this better world. And that eventually launched me on my second career. So I guess the second career, which was in setting up a strategic consulting practice, the reason I guess I did change was it was a desire to get more of a work-life balance and it prompted me to take a leap of faith and to set up my own small company. But the only reason it was possible was because of this community network of a whole bunch of other professionals building their own small practices where we shared skills, where we didn't have it, we went to each other and helped out. We referred each other to our opportunities, we delivered on each other's projects, and we trusted in one another in a way that I hadn't seen happen in large corporations. In 2001, an American researcher called Robert Putnam, he published a book called Bowling Alone. I'm, some of you out there may have read it. If not, and, and you want to, you're interested in this topic, it's, I highly recommend it. It's a seminal book, great book to read. He reminded people that underlying all businesses, all economies, all societies is this thing called social capital. Social capital is a way of describing the level of mutual trust that exists in a society so that we can trust complete strangers. And then we can do deals with them. We can do transactions with them. If our social capital is poor, we lack trust in strangers. And then our ability to work with one another is poor. And innovation in business and economic and social activity suffers. So in my view, competition for profit can erode social capital if it causes us to be less trusting in strangers through broken business promises and immoral behavior. Volunteer organizations tend to create social capital and businesses tend to consume it. We can't, and the, the whole bottom line point of this is that you can't have financial capital or economic strength without social capital. So it holds all, it, it really holds in my mind that all organizations need to honor the social capital of a society in which they operate. The issue is that many people aren't even aware that social capital exists. 
And if you don't know it exists, why would you look after it? It runs the risks of becoming unknown, unappreciated and unknowingly exploited. So really it probably behooves me to say, how can we help build social capital before I kind of leave this topic? So I'm just gonna deviate a little back into that. So, and also explain a bit more about some of the things, that, threads that have run through my life. So I mentioned that um, volunteering can build, volunteer organizations tend to build social capital and Surf Life Savings is an organization that builds social capital in communities. And it, and it does it in many ways, not least of all educating nippers and patrol members and surf rescue skills. So for the past five years, I've been a trainer with my local club. It's incredibly rewarding actually training people on how to save other people's lives and to do it safely so their own life is not put at risk. And it always comes back after, you know, whenever I've put in the effort, when someone comes to me and says, it tells me this story and it happened twice last year, they came and told me stories of how they rescued someone last season. And I think about how important that is, is that on that day that they rescued someone, a family stayed whole. Somebody went home alive that they may not have otherwise. So it's an incredibly important way of building social capital of doing these sorts of things. But to do the training part well is a skill. Back in my early 20s, I met a woman called Stephanie Burns and she's a leading adult educator in Australia. Um, and I've used what I've learned from her then to play my part through training in various different roles in trying to help build social capital, to build community and to build trust. But importantly, Stephanie points out something that I think is really crucial, lesson learned. If you can't put yourself in the your shoes of your students, if you, can't, if you forget what it is like to be a learner, if you can't remember to see the world through the perspective of a learner, you will be a poorer teacher. And that's why I recently took up ski paddling as my latest learner challenge. I'm reminded every time I go out trying to practice paddling through the surf, usually because I fall out, how it feels to be a learner. I think this notion um, applies not only to teachers and trainers, but to most of our roles in life, when you remember what it feels like to be a learner, and it's something that Harry and, and Kiara have talked about as well, you stumble onto remembering you only learn when you make mistakes. And so from that, it follows that no matter how expert we find ourselves to be when we're a few decades into our life, um, to be a better leader or a better researcher, it means being open to learning, not only from other success, but crucially from our own mistakes. So that means for me to be a better researcher, me and everybody else who feels, feels shares this idea, you've got to keep your ego in check. And you've got to remember that this cult of certainty, it's a very poor idol for a researcher, a trainer, a leader, or I would, I would add a politician to worship, a politician to worship at. So have I had a chance to put this into practice myself in business? And that leads me on to telling you a bit about um, career number three. So um, I was really, I've been really lucky in my life, I think, in my jobs. And for eight years, I got to work in a small to medium sized Australian enterprise, which was a, a company selling specialist mining products around the world. And in my role as a GM, I got to practice and continually learn what it meant to be a better boss than I was the day before. So my colleague, Max Voigt, became a mentor and a lifelong friend. And the lesson he helped me put into practice was that the person in my team doing the job knew the job better than I did. My job was to help them not to do their job for them. And in the end, I think I learned more from my team than they learned from me. You know, I look back and I think some of the best times of my life were removing the obstacles for these amazing people to deliver unending product innovation and amazing customer service. And so I think this notion of removing obstacles also applies to social systems. In tackling social problems like pandemics, natural disasters and the climate crisis, and there's, you know, there's many more disasters, there's so much opportunity here. Um, politicians and government agencies, I think, could benefit from listening to people, identifying what obstacles are there and focusing on removing the obstacles. For instance, if getting an appointment for a vaccine is the obstacle, the government's job is to remove that obstacle, not label people as unwilling. So why did I decide five years ago to even up the score of university degrees versus careers if you've been keeping track? Let me take you to my next cycle. Um, university for the third time. I guess in my experience, just when my ego is in danger of getting too big and I think that I don't have anything more to learn, um, life throws me a curveball. 
Um, and the upside of this is that usually it's followed by an opportunity and it's Miss Medway's struggles and stars all over again as a constant theme in my life. In 2016, I stepped back from my corporate career for a bunch of reasons, not least of all being actually incredibly tired. Um, but I wanted, one of the main things was I wanted to spend more time with my teenage daughter. And I also wanted to be part of a solution to the looming disaster risks that I could see building up in our environment, our economy, our infrastructure and our society. And it wasn't okay for me to do nothing and just pass the risk forward to my daughter's generation. So I swapped my corporate suits for jeans and I headed back to uni. Um, oh, oh my gosh, how much have I learned in the past five years from disaster resilience experts such as my current supervisor, Graham Brewer, and I shout out to Tim Roberts, who's my co-supervisor. Thank you, Tim, for putting up with me for 18 months. Um, Graham Brewer is also a volunteer member of his local SES unit. So Graham is actually social capital in action. He forms linkages between academia, community, and the SES, emergency services. And it was back then in, in um, then next part of it was in 2019, I got the opportunity for degrees to to take an edge and get a lead ahead of careers. Because as you recall, I'm a career number three, but I'm now actually just tipped into um, university for fourth time. It was in those carefree pre-COVID days, if any of you can remember what that felt like. I applied for and I won a scholarship for a PhD, which is the PhD I'm doing is funded by the Hunter Valley Flood Mitigation Scheme. Um, if you're not sure where that sits, it's actually a government department because the assets in the Hunter Valley are owned by the New South Wales government and it's part of the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. The Hunter Valley Flood Mitigation Scheme team see the increasing flood risk from climate change, where there's been a, a five year strategic project review that demonstrates this. Um, and it layers on top of existing, what's called existing residual flood risk. Residual flood risk being the levees have a limit a physical limit and above that extreme floods will overtop them and so that residual risk is extreme flooding into our communities. They want to help close the research gap and the aim is to protect lives and to reduce damages and losses from levee overtopping extreme flood events. So before I, um, before I tell you, dig, dig, start to dig into my PhD, I just want to take a quick reflection about my journey since I've been le since leaving school. And I guess I have to say that everything I've learned from my successes and my failures has prepared me to undertake this PhD. My PhD is in what I call, what is, what is called the social sciences, which I referred to earlier. And it's, I, I'm peering basically into human social behavior. And I guess without my crazy journey and all the lessons I think I've learned from my methods, my mentors over the years, I don't think I could have tackled a topic this big or this central to our society's well-being. So to set the scene for my PhD, in Australia, in this land of droughts and flooding rains, floods are the costliest natural disaster and the second most deadly. With climate change, the impacts are expected to grow and that means the social and economic costs will just get bigger. Householders are the people who bear the brunt of these costs and yet they are also the least prepared to mitigate these growing impacts. And that is why it is so important to me to devote three years of my life to researching what we can do better. So we can get ahead of this cost curve and actually protect our households. So let me tell you about my PhD topic and what I hope to contribute to research and to society. So um, extreme floods. It's really hard to answer the question, the questions to make my flood plan, have I learned about how an extreme flood will unfold over 24 hours around where I live, where it will reach and when it will leave? If yes, why? If not, why not? Now look, it's hard, not least of all because most of our decisions, actions, emotions and behaviours actually occur below our conscious awareness. It's, this is reflecting like 90% of an iceberg is submerged beneath the surface and why an iceberg is actually a great metaphor for the way our brain works. It's crucial, as Professor Brannigan taught me way back in my honours year, to recognise that what we see on the surface is incomplete. We must not make the titanic mistake of thinking that the underlying realm can be do, read directly from our surface human behaviours. We can only understand why we make decisions by studying the indirect signals that come up from deep below. So before I deep dive you into my research topic a bit more, 
let's take an everyday example that's probably more, more common and everyone's more familiar with. So your surface worry about traffic accidents, the risk of having a tra traffic accident, your fear of having a traffic accident won't explain why you decide whether you can safely trop, stop when traffic lights turn yellow. Actually, what you need to ask are some deep dive questions such as, do you think about getting a fine because in fact you don't have that many points left on your license? Or alternatively, do you worry about being late to pick up your kids from daycare? Do you calculate your speed and your stopping distance? Or do you actually worry about the person who's tailgating you and whether they're gonna stop in time? Or do you just do what mum and dad taught you to do all those years ago, or more recently, if you're a new driver? Or do you even not even have a choice if the person in front of you slams on their brakes? Emergency service organisations have set out to educate us in the risk of living on floodplains. And this can include fear appeals. The common idea is if we just know more about a risk, fear will motivate us to prepare for that risk. Think about COVID-19 as a current example. Have you seen fear appeals? How do they make you feel? Like our fear of traffic accidents or COVID-19, our fear of floods is an incomplete surface image. It's a risk perception and it sits at the top. And if you're thinking it won't explain why we decide to prepare for floods, you are right. Some people with high risk perception do not prepare, whilst others with low risk perception, they do prepare. 15 years of flood preparedness research has studied our general surface attitudes to flood risk and getting prepared. It's kind of equivalent to a detailed surface, surface survey from a drone of a random bunch of icebergs floating around Antarctica, but done in this way, as you can imagine, it's an incomplete snapshot. We've actually, pardon the pun, barely scratched beneath the surface. We've not, let alone drilled or found a way of seeing into the core of the iceberg. To do, that, to do that in this PhD, first, I actually need to build a tool that is suited to either drilling or observing into this hidden realm. Together with these two facts, what you, what you can see is it's a really big gap. And because, because how can our education campaigns change behavior if the underlying reasons aren't understood and if we actually don't have a tool yet to do the drilling or the peering or observing into the ice core? So my research, I aim to build that tool and to use it to explore householders' reasons why, why not, and why to put it off. When we don't know, because the key thing is, when we don't know what action to take, we tend to do nothing. When we lack confidence and we feel that fear from that fear appeal, we tend to rationalise away the risk. So fear appeals don't work. It's the reason why they don't work. All they'll do for people who lack confidence is to inhibit them from doing anything. So I aim to use those things to talk to people one-on-one -on -one and to use social theory behavior and the tool that I'm gonna to create to find out the underlying reasons why they do or they do not um, learn and prepare. We need a better option than fear appeals. They're not working for us. We need to know what will help people decide on the best option and who or what experience will help lift their confidence so they can take action. And then frankly, we need to get cracking on it. As I said before in Australia, floods are the costliest natural disaster and the second most deadly. 45% of flood deaths are from people driving into floodwaters. And unlike our yellow traffic lights, most people don't have personal experience or training in an extreme flood event. By changing our research approach and looking at the iceberg differently, looking at it by drilling or from within, we can actually, using a new suite of tools, I believe we can get better at targeting our education campaigns and reducing flood damages and hence to save lives. So that's what I hope to do over the next 18 months um, that I have left in my PhD. So to, to try and bring it all to a close, my science odyssey, I guess, continues to unfold. And I'm sure there'll be some more twists and turns on the road ahead. But there'll be some constants in my life now my experiences of the past three decades, plus the most recent three years as part of a community here in Stockton, fighting to be heard, has taught me that community engagement isn't enough. There are lessons governments should heed when dealing with man-made disasters. Research evidence shows our public servants, and pardon me, but the emphasis on the word servants to the, people, to the public, will have to learn this thing called participatory governance. It does mean letting go of the need to be right. And it also means letting community participate in the definition of the problem and the solutions. 
Having traveled that path, I do appreciate the struggles of such a journey. Nevertheless, it's time everyone got cracking on it. I plan to keep training people in surf rescue skills and disaster resilience every chance I get. And um, as you might, if you've been keeping track, I need to even out the degree versus career score. So I'm going to need to build career number four, whatever that ends up looking like. Um, I have no intention of going around to a fifth time in this cycle of uni and um, careers, but I've finally learned to never say never. Um, so thank you for your time um, and attendance. And I wish we could have done this live because I think I really would have enjoyed the subtle social magic of actually your company and companionship when it was live. So thank you. And I'm going to hand back to Tim. Thanks very much, Willow. That was fantastic. Fantastic to not only learn your odyssey through many countries and many different careers, particularly in Nundal. I, I love to go to Nundal and do some gold panning but uh, also to get an insight into what is a PhD. So a PhD for those uh, in the audience, and uh, we've got uh, quite a significant number of you still uh, listening to us after this hour. A PhD is where one person studies very, very, uh, very, very strictly one particular topic, uh, and at the end of it, writes a thesis. And the thesis is usually the result of three years work on one particular topic. From the thesis comes all sorts of things. Sometimes comes scientific publications, sometimes comes careers, sometimes comes inventions where a, a new uh, discovery has been made during the detailed work of the thesis and that then leads to a whole new industry be it the the lasers or be it uh, the particular gene splicing techniques that have let us do the pcr reactions that will then uh, let us put new genes in and so on all of those things come from phd students studying one top topic very 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 uh, closely. And uh, for the word, just a word to anybody who's associated with a student doing a PhD, you never ask them, how is the thesis coming along? Because that's when they go berserk. So that is, that is where we are at present. What I want to do now is share my screen and we'll go to questions and Ask answers. So let's share my screen uh, and go to the next slide. Did that go to the next slide? Yes. So I'll leave this one up for a little while because some of you may want to take a note of our email address and send us an email about something that uh, you're thinking of. But um, what, uh, what we'll be doing also is putting the recording live uh, and you'll be able to listen to that if you wish. But now let's go to the questions and the answers. And I see we haven't got many questions and answers in from you, although I've got a whole, a whole uh, swathe of them here sitting on my notepad. I want to go first of all to the question from Ross, uh, and his question is really, uh, young people of today seem to be programmed to be lazy with short attention spans, so how can STEM progress if there's no candidates able to do the basic things required to do STEM? I wonder, Kiara, if you'd like to have a go at that, and also Harry and perhaps Willow. Over to Kiara. Absolutely. So personally, I'm someone who has volunteered with countless kids and teenagers, all with an interest in STEM. My personal take is that it's not about being lazy. Uh, this is something I often see in my own generation and even older, that laziness, but it's actually about cultivating an interest. So there are so many different areas of STEM that if you don't like one, you might have an interest 
in something entirely different but still within the realm of STEM. So one of the reasons that that cultivation of interest doesn't happen is often, more often than not, at like a socioeconomic means, a lot of families can't afford it. But then we have places like uh, the Hunter Innovation and Science Hub, HISH, who, much like tonight, put on subsidized or free science events. Um, I take the mini electric vehicle festival uh, around to schools and stuff like that. Uh, so does the science and engineering challenge. So I don't think it's about that they're lazy and they have short attention spans. I just think it's it's really about getting them hooked and, and finding that interest that really keeps them hooked. And, forms a passion within them. So I, I hope that answers the question. Thanks very much. Uh, anybody else like to have a go? Yeah, I might have just a quick um, something on that, Tim. Uh, I come from a long line of public servants and my dad was a high school teacher. And I think, unfortunately, if we're if our kids are programmed to be lazy and short attention spans through access to technology and lots of stimulus, Unfortunately, it falls on the teachers, you know, pillar of our society to continue to connect kids with STEM and empower them to be able to, you know, connect with maths is, you know, and, and whatever science that might be. Uh, for instance, the decision to make maths non-mandatory, from my perspective, I would have enjoyed that early on. I elected to take a gamble, ended up loving maths. And so it was the teacher who really enabled me to connect with that. And so I think that's going to have to be our way, education and teachers who are just so important. Thanks very much, Harry. We'll move on to the next question before I start with some of mine. Uh, this one goes, thank you for the great talks. I'm wondering how research can be continued when there are restrictions and other impacts of the pandemic, particularly for practical projects and deadlines for honours such as Kiara has at present. What can these wonderful young people and their supports do? Will I you first and then Kiara? Yeah, thanks, Tim, and, and thanks for the question. Actually, it's a really pertinent one because, frankly, I was just about to start my fieldwork data collection and um, COVID restrictions hit. Um, so it's one of those things where you can try and change it um, and shift it a bit. So I could, for instance, do Zoom meetings. It's not as good. It, it is harder in COVID, but you can use other mechanisms to do it. Um, so for me, basically, the bottom line is that the universities and my supervisors are really supportive and we step back and have a look at what we can do differently um, and try and manage it and make it work. Um, the other part of it is then trying to manage people's access to parts of the university. I don't have to be at the university to do mine and continue mine, so I guess I'm in a lucky position. As long as I can find people that are willing to have a chat with me, whether it's um, on Zoom until we can get back face to face, then I can still make um, some, some progress. I know other people in, um, in my PhD room who are doing more practical ones that involve work, they have to manage and try and get access to the university, to the labs and stuff. So that is, it is more difficult if for whatever reason those labs get locked down. So Tim, I might hand back to you or to Kiara. Kiara, please. So as someone who, my honours project is based in the lab and has been going all year up until lockdown, I'm currently on pause, luckily, uh, my supervisor, Jeff, has an amazing research assistant, Casey Miller, uh, and she has taken over some of the experiments for me while this lockdown is happening. But there's a lot that I'm missing out on simply because I, as an honour student, aren't permitted to go into the lab. So I've sat down and talked to Jeff, for example, and said, hey, <clears throat> you know, this massive portion of the thesis isn't going to be submitted. What do I do? Uh, the university has, well, my faculty has offered an extension on the thesis submission date. And that is, hasn't been set in stone in regards to like when the new submission date is. It's, it, they're basing it on when lockdown actually ends. So that's very useful, but uh, it's, it's very restrictive. Like I said, luckily I've been talking with Jeff and we've worked out some other stuff that I can do. I've been helping him with some writing. Um, so my time isn't being completely wasted sitting at home on my butt. Um, it's just really about talking to the people who are in charge of you and looking at your project and going, okay, well, this has been cut out. What can I replace it with? And what can I do in this meantime? And a lot of it for me has been working on my thesis, for example, writing that up. So it's really just about being flexible. 
Thank you for that, Kiara. I might say that every cloud's got a silver lining. And uh, I hear that you now have a job doing the genetic analysis uh, for detecting whether some, somebody's COVID positive or negative. Can you tell us about that, Kiara? Yes, so that, <laughs> thank you. Um, that's the job I start on Monday. Um, so I'll be technically assisting in the COVID-19 labs at the university, uh, helping the people running the genetic analysis and the PCR testing. Uh, so just helping get those those positive and negative results out as soon as possible so that we can really get this COVID situation it, you know, under wraps in the Hunter region. Well done, well done. Harry, could I ask you a question, please? Uh, you're, you're a mixed up engineer from what I can see. Uh, what Can you give us a rundown on what sort of engineers there are and what sort of, what sort of varied things engineers do? Uh, yeah, yep. Um, I think a good quote uh, is uh, scientists describe the world we live in and engineers create the world we aren't living in yet. Uh, so that's one to keep in mind. Uh, so with, with engineering, uh, it comes from a background of fundamentals, math, science, and this at the core of it. But where, where you take engineering can be very high level, conceptual. It can be, you know, qualitative you're doomed or you're not doomed that will stay up or that won't stay up or it can be very down to you can put 7,000 kilograms on the second floor before the beams start to bend beyond the point of uh, you know it being stable and so within that I would say I'm very conceptual you know it's catchment scale it's solutions that come that they might be pretty obvious, but the modeling I do is to verify whether something is going to impact on the receiving environment or the existing environment from an environmental. But if I was to do water engineering design, I might go into your damn wall needs to be uh, reinforced by this amount, you know, width of clay core followed by this much concrete and scale everything and do it so that it's a design drawing. You have, um, well, engineering is a growing field. Um, you know, medical engineering and renewable energy engineering uh, degrees added, say, at U University of Newcastle that are constantly expanding on our conventional civil, chemical, um, electrical, mechatronic, uh, mechanical engineering degrees. Uh, and really, they're just taking one branch of science at a time or two or three specific branches and putting them into a, we can create solutions. So if it's chemistry and, um, you know, processes, process engineering you might go oh that's chemical engineering or if it's physics and uh, building a plane that's mechanical so i i think it's very specific engineering needs to be specific but within that you can have a bit of variety at high level or detailed design sort of so that's that's been my experience with my short time in industry thanks very much harry i've got a question for kiara um, you're doing laboratory research. So where, where does laboratory research go? Do you see that uh, it's, it's just an accumulation of more papers and more, uh, and, and, and more knowledge? Or is it uh, some practical application that results in, in money for you and a patent? What, where does research go in your view? The sort of laboratory research? Thanks, Tim. Um, I think it's been a mix of both depending on what you're actually researching. So a lot of my stuff, for example, uh, is designed to help inform public health guidelines and the general public on what they can do to be safer. Um, someone else in my reproductive science group uh, they look at horse fertility because that's a huge industry. They've designed uh, a keeper of the, the sperm samples. So it, it helps the sperm samples stay healthy for longer. And that's actually been applied throughout reproductive um, equine research centers throughout Australia. So it really depends on the type of research that you're doing um, and what can come of that. But you're always looking for opportunities to either grow knowledge or, you know, make some kind of invention, I guess. 
Thank you. Thank you. What I'd like to do now, ladies and gentlemen, is just to ask the panelists one question that we have uh, kicked around a little bit in our discussions in preparing this, uh, uh, this set of talks. And by the way, uh, I'm just so pleased and proud of, of Willow and Harry and Kiara for putting so much time and effort into this idea and making it work. So in case I forget to say that to you three, I really, really do, do uh, thank you very much. But just a question about global warming, a question about the erosion of the, of, uh, the beach at, at Stockton, a question about snow failing to, uh, failing to fall. Um, what, what do you think uh, about global warming and climate change and what needs are there from your point of view. So who's first, second, and third? I think it's, I think it's, oh, well, I'm not sure. No hands are coming I'll up. I'll have a go. I'll, Kiara, I'll take the first thank one. you. Especially from someone who I don't particularly have an environmental science background. I've got a lot of friends in the field, but it's not really what I do. I've always got that, um, that thought in the back of my head that the politicians and the people in charge, and this is an opinion, um, they need to pay better attention to the scientists and the experts in the field. Um, my research, for example, it seems like it's something that can only apply to human fertility, but if it's something that I can apply to um, breeding programs for endangered species, then I will absolutely do that. If there is a pathway in, I will do it. But most importantly, we just need the people above us to pay better attention. Thank you. Will I? Tim, I I might make a little comment, um, you know, Stockton, Stockton's a man-made disaster and it's been going on for 150 years. So it's, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Um, it's basically been um, the breakwaters, which are, you know, they're an economic asset and they have been for the last 150 years for the whole of Australia. It's not just the New South Wales economy that was built on it, but they have consequences. The problem was we just can't see these problems soon enough. We need to open our eyes and let go of certainty. So one of the really, I guess, interesting facts is fundamentally this beautiful sandbank that used to be offshore of Stockton that was, a, you know, went out for a kilometre and was 2.4 um, metres deep. And the old maritime maps from the 1800s show that. It's all gone. So in the southern compartment, that's that's 8 million cubic, meter, million cubic metres of sand that's disappeared. Um, it's been, it's, it's travelled north with longshore transport away, it's gone. And so the biggest, the reason why we didn't make, the reason why we, we weren't able to act on it sooner was there was this challenge between experts who were doing modelling and lay people in Stockton who were saying, no, the sand's going faster than you think. It, it can't be right. That math does not make sense because fundamentally they were saying that we were losing um, 20 to 30,000 cubic metres of sand each year. Um, and there was about 20,000 cubic metres of sand that was meant to is being dumped each year by the David Allen. So it sounded like it was in balance. So it really, why are we still eroding? And so people, simple people would just go, hey, there's a lot more sand disappearing. It's not in balance. It can't be right. That is not the right figure. And the most recent modelling, of course, has said that it's more like 146,000 cubic metres of sand being lost on an annual basis, which is why over the period of time it's taken, you know, this long, but we've lost that 8 million cubic metres of sand and now it's been, been verified. So now we're dealing with the problem, but there was a lot earlier point at which we could have known about it if we'd listened to lay people. I think it's incredibly important, these conversations between community and scientists and building trust and that thing called particip participatory government governance is everyone gets together and everyone gets to define the problem and then talk about the solutions and agree what are the options and then help choose which option are we going to choose and we need to get better at that because we've got many disasters in the pipeline unless we get better at learning how to solve them more quickly we will have more losses. Thank you Willow. Harry you don't get a go because my clock says 7 30 so I wish to say good night to everybody. Thank you for being with us and uh, look forward to the next one when it happens. Thank you, Willow. Thank you, Kiara. Thank you, Harry. Goodbye. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.